welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today for Neuroalectics webinar. My name is Rafa Novak and I will be your host today. Uh, we are back uh, with our series of webinars. Uh, we'll do it regularly, so you can expect next webinar already next month. And today we'll be talking about EEG markers of cognitive decline. And I'm very happy to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Aureli Soria Frisch. Hi, Aureli. Hello, how are you, Rafael? Fine, Good. how are you? Very well. Good. Good to have you here. Uh, we'll begin with Aureli's presentation, and uh, this will be followed by Q&A period. So please feel free to submit your questions at any time using uh, Q&A tool. Please remember to use chat for a technical on other issue and use Q&A tools for, uh, for questions. Uh, so please let me quickly introduce uh, our speaker. Dr. Aureli Soria Frisch holds a PhD from the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, his PhD is in engineering and he's passionate about bringing machine learning to real world applications, uh, which he has done for over 20 years in different academic and industry positions. He currently focuses on the use of artificial intelligence to transform the manner in which neuroimaging data and especially EEG are used in clinical domain. So obviously a lot of short interest with uh, us here at Neuroelectrics. Uh, welcome Aureli, all yours. I can see that you are ready with the presentation already. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you very much for the invitation or the chance to explain about uh, our work on cognitive decline markers. I'm very happy to be here and I will go over different uh, things in my talk. This is the outline basically. So I will explain you a bit what's uh, Starlab and what are our activities in EEG. And I will start uh, on the topic that we started to work uh, at the beginning, which was basically the characterization of Park uh, Parkinson's disease and especially the prodromal phase of Parkinson's disease with EEG which is uh, related with uh, also with MCI and AD. That's uh, the second part of my talk. I will present you a system for cognitive decline assessment that we have and are being developing at Starlab. And then I will uh, give you also an insight on other markers, uh, more useful and more advanced, uh, also based on, on EEG. So Starlab is a private company, which was funded in the year 2000. Basically, it's a, a technology transfer a company trying to uh, transform uh, scientific results into uh, products and services that have a positive social impact. And with this idea in mind, we have been focusing on one of our patients, which is basically the electric brain. So the fact that uh, information is coded uh, through electrical uh, uh, through electricity in the brain, and this is transferred from one area to the other uh, in form also of electricity. This gives you the opportunity basically to measure it with uh, non-invasive methodologies like EEG, and also to modulate it with uh, transcranial current stimulation, for instance. And our activities are mainly focused on two areas. The first one is the discovery of new biomarkers based on uh, uh, EEG. You can see here a picture of uh, projects in which we are involved developing these kind of markers, as well as developing uh, therapeutic interventions based on uh, brain stimulation where we concretely are developing uh, systems for the measurement of consciousness and as well as a stroke rehabilitation system based on PDCS. But I, I won't talk about that uh, today. I will focus on the biomarker discovery uh, activities at Starlab. Uh, we are active in five different areas. Uh, Four of them are focused on EEG, which is uh, the first one is providing services for uh, the characterization of drug, drug response in uh, trials of uh, pharmaceutical companies. We are very active as well in uh, characterizing neurodegenerative diseases as well as neurodevelopment. I, we will be touching today the neurodegenerative uh, disease area. And we have another uh, area which is uh, devoted to the characterization of emotional response of users 
to different external stimuli. Um, basically, all our markers are based on EEG, which is captured with this kind. This is a, an introductory part, a very basic one. Uh, EEG is captured with this kind of devices. So, uh, and uh, basically, each of these electrodes is capturing one uh, signal that varies over uh, time. So you can see here a recording of eight different electrodes and how it's the uh, variance over time of these different uh, time signals. A usual way of analyzing uh, this kind of signals, if you, they are very similar to what you would see in audio signals, not in terms of frequency, but in terms of their evolution over time. And as you do in uh, audio signals, you basically use this kind of equalizers that allows you uh, to measure and modulate the different uh, uh, rhythms and the different frequency bands of your music. So in the same uh, sense, uh, EEG has also uh, these uh, frequency bands, uh, these uh, different rhythms that receive different names, which are very well established. Delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. And basically, uh, they are characterizing different intervals in the frequency domain. And the most basic markers are based on the combination of the power as measured in these different uh, bounds. And now I will start the part of the different uh, biomarkers we have developed uh, in the past and we are developing nowadays. The first uh, Mm. activity we were involved was in a project uh, for the Michael J. Fox Foundation, where we were trying to characterize activity of uh, subjects which suffer from a, a disease, a sleep disease, that it's called REM behavior disorder. So this person in the video is suffering from this REM behavior disorder, and basically these people do not have uh, muscle inhibition while they are on a REM stage in sleep. So they are basically acting their uh, dreams. So this person is completely asleep, but it's uh, acting as if, it, if uh, he would be uh, awake. And this is a disease that appears at the age more or less of 60 years old, and that uh, it implies a certain risk of developing later on uh, either a neuro neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson disease or any type of dementia like le dementia with Levy bodies. This happens in 30 and 30% 30 of the cases respectively. And 50% of these subjects remain RBD at the, uh, uh, eight, in average, eight years later. So eight years is the time where uh, this disease develops into uh, the neurodegenerative disease. So our idea uh, at Starlab was trying to look into markers that uh, of EEG that was acquired at the time where the subjects were just uh, diagnosed with REM behavior, uh, uh, REM behavior disorder and looking if we could find any markers that could be predictive of the neurodegeneration. And basically, uh, this is something that has been already reported in the literature. So uh, this is a paper from Fantini and colleagues from 2003. And basically what you can observe is an increase in the slow rhythms, in the low frequency rhythms, like the theta rhythms in the frontal and in the temporal part, which is significant uh, increase with respect to the rhythm in the healthy controls. So you have much more power in low uh, frequency bands than healthy controls. And on the other hand, so in the uh, high uh, frequencies, healthy controls show more power, like in the beta band, show more power than uh, uh, subjects which are diagnosed with RBD. And this is something that has been reproduced, for instance, in this paper of Idanso and colleagues in 2010. So again, so they found increased power in delta, theta, alpha band in the central electrodes, increase in MCI, this is the group in white, with respect to R RBD and RBD 
uh, again, so increase uh, levels of power with respect to healthy controls. And on the other hand, in uh, large frequency bands like the beta band, they show that uh, healthy controls have larger power than uh, RBD patients. And so basically we were analyzing a data set of uh, EEG while subjects were at the uh, stage of having RBD, but we had already the follow-up eight years later. And eight years before the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease on dementia of Levy bodies, we could observe a significant difference in the uh, power spectrum. So you find here power in the Y axis, while in the X axis you find uh, frequency. And here you see the very typical increase in the alpha uh, band uh, when you close the eyes. And you see here the different groups. In blue, you have the group of dementia with Levy bodies. In green, you have the group of Parkinson's disease. And then you have the groups suffering from RBD and then the, and the healthy control inside. And basically you could observe already eight years before the neurodegenerative disease was diagnosed or the dementia with Levy bodies, that there was a significant difference in terms of power. We have found this in a group of 100 patients. And uh, basically here, what you see is this power increase and a decrease of power in the uh, higher frequency bands. And you can see here some of the details of the uh, processing that we have to done in order to find out these differences. This again, uh, another study also with the same group of patients, dementia with Levy bodies in blue again, the Parkinson's disease, uh, RBD group, and the uh, last one is the healthy control. And you can find again in a group of 200 patients that there are significant differences uh, already before eight years before the uh, Parkinson's disease is diagnosed. Uh, this is a particular electrode. You can find also uh, synchronization measures that offer also a discrete miniative power between different groups. And this is what you can see here. This is the coherence. This is a particular synchronization measure. And this is what you can observe in the different frequency bands. And again, you can see uh, when averaging over different electrodes, significant differences in coherence uh, uh, in the group of RBD with respect to the group that suffers neurodegeneration uh, eight years later. Uh, you basically analyze this by averaging the power in the different bands. And this is uh, what you have here, the different uh, frequency bands, and this is the level of uh, power. And you can see a significant difference, for instance, in theta uh, and in alpha with re respect to the healthy controls that is the same or very similar to the one that was that had been observed in the literature that we that I have shown so far. Um, this is another way of displaying. Here, what you have is the uh, basically the difference in band power in the different electrodes as displayed in the skull. So you have here the level of significance, the p-value in each of the different electrodes uh, of the group uh, suffering from RBD with respect to the groups that will uh, develop neurodegeneration late eight years later. In the this is in the case of the band theta. And as you can see, you can uh, observe uh, significant differences in all of the electrodes that we have analyzed. Uh, this is another kind of visualization. If you um, focus on the uh, power spectral response, which is this response that you have here on the right, and you look at the frequency in which uh, this peak of frequency appears and characterize this frequency, this is what you can display here for the different groups. This is a healthy control group. This is the RBD, the PD, and the dementia with Levy bodies. And here you have in colors the value of the frequency at which this uh, spectral response is uh, presents a peak. And basically, basically in the healthy controls, this peak is in larger frequencies than uh, the one that can be observed, for instance, in dementia with Levy bodies. So this is process 
of uh, uh, the peak of the alpha frequency going to uh, uh, slower frequencies is, is uh, denoted as uh, slowing of the EEG. And so far I have been presenting results for Parkinson disease, but uh, interestingly enough, this is something that you can observe as well in MCI and Alzheimer's disease uh, patients. Uh, for instance, this is a paper of 2018. This is a review of different biomarkers in EEG, but also in uh, response uh, linked to a, to a particular task, which are called event-related potential. And this is a review of different markers. And here you can observe one of the uh, plots of this uh, paper where you can see a comparison of healthy controls in black. And again, this slowing of the EEG, this shift of the alpha peak frequency for vascular dementia in red and for Alzheimer's disease, together with this an increase of uh, power in uh, low frequency bands. Uh, this has been also reported in another uh, interesting study by Mehdadi and colleagues of 2021. One interesting plot is here, uh, this one, which basically offers uh, an interesting rationale for uh, using EEG biomarkers in the context of uh, cognitive decline. Basically, while using uh, MRI or CSF uh, markers are very much linked to the pathophysiology of the uh, cognitive decline process, EEG can be used as well as other neuroimaging uh, markers can be used to characterize uh, the neural act the underlying neural activities, which are directly linked to the process of uh, cognitive impairment. And this is a very interesting uh, feature of uh, EEG together with the cost factor, uh, which is uh, much uh, cost-effective uh, modality than other neuroimaging uh, 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 neuroimaging uh, data modalities. Uh, Mehtali and colleagues in 2021 have uh, conducted a study in MCI in Alzheimer's disease and a comparison with uh, healthy control patients at different stages of aging. And basically what they have found, for instance, is uh, significant differences in theta power between uh, MCI, the group in MCI, and the group in AD. You have here, again, uh, the uh, rel relative power in theta, uh, the different uh, groups. And basically here you have the difference uh, of the different uh, of the different groups between the healthy control, the MCI, and the Alzheimer's disease. This is the difference between uh, the two groups. And uh, where you have uh, more strong points, there is, a, there is an electrode with uh, significant differences between the groups. So as you can see, the differences between the Alzheimer's disease and the MCI group is uh, uh, significant in most of the electrodes in the theta power. This appears as well in the alpha power. So there is a, again a reduction in the Alzheimer's disease of the power in alpha, basically based on the fact that the peak of alpha is uh, shifting to lower frequencies. And this is what you can observe, basically a decrease of power in the alpha band that it's also significant between the MCI group and the uh, group which is, uh, who is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and that is uh, significant in almost all of the electrodes. Uh, in this other uh, review by Babylonian colleagues of 2021, uh, one, they give a rationale for this uh, uh, reduction in alpha and beta power, which is basically the thalamocortical loops are dominated in normal aging by alpha and beta rhythms, while in Alzheimer's disease and in cognitive decline, they are dominated by delta and, and theta uh, rhythms. And basically, one interesting uh, part of uh, this uh, review 
uh, which is based on an expert panel, is that uh, you can use EEG uh, for characterizing this cognitive decline phase uh, while it is important, and this is one of the recommendations, to uh, establish uh, standardization and a harmonization uh, data acquisition procedures, uh, especially if you are conducting studies uh, with different centers. And as the most established uh, measures, they uh, recommend to use these uh, power spectral density measures, as well as some other ones that uh, we will analyze later on and uh, offer and recommend basically to use these EEG uh, markers for the stratification of AD patients and the uh, monitoring of disease uh, progression. Uh, so basically uh, in this review, as well as in the review that we have seen before of Howard and uh, colleagues of 2018, they basically uh, propose to use a ratio of, uh, of uh, power between the slow rhythms, the delta and the theta bands uh, with respect to the alpha and beta uh, bands. So which is called and received the name of slow to paced uh, ratio. It's a ratio of different uh, frequencies. Uh, this has been uh, uh, proposed in these two review papers as well as some other ratio, like the ratio between the theta power and the alpha power, which uh, counts with uh, several papers where they propose to use this ratio just between the rhythms in the theta band and the alpha band. This ratio is basically trying to characterize this shifting of the alpha uh, peak towards uh, the uh, towards the uh, slow rhythms in the frequency spectrum. Uh, this has been, for instance, proposed in the paper uh, by uh, Mehdavi. Uh, another uh, marker that has been uh, proposed in the literature with several papers, I'm uh, 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 mentioning here three different papers, the already uh, mentioned one by Mehdavi is the so-called peak alpha frequency, which is basically which is the frequency in which you can observe the uh, alpha uh, the alpha frequency peak or the most uh, the most prominent uh, peak in the spectrum. So you can see here again the spectrum frequency and the amplitude, and you can see here the cognitive decline uh, group with uh, uh, respect uh, to the uh, healthy aging which is in blue. And you can see the shifting. And if you compute at which frequency this uh, peak appears, you can find significant differences between the AD at early stage and the healthy controls uh, uh, in normal aging. This has been analyzed as well in the already mentioned paper by Mehdadi with significant differences between MCI and AD, but also with some effects of aging, these three different groups of healthy controls are uh, groups of different ages, and you can find also an effect of uh, regular and normal aging that affects this uh, peak alpha frequency. Uh, so with this background, uh, we have been developing at StarLab a tool that can be used by uh, technicians and other interested uh, uh, personnel uh, in order to characterize the cognitive uh, decline uh, process. Uh, so as you may know, this is an interesting paper by Sabak and colleagues uh, from 2020. There is a need for early detection of mild cognitive impairment uh, that would be especially useful in primary uh, healthcare. So there are uh, no effective and side effect free early diagnosis tools for conducting this cognitive de decline uh, detection. There is a large heterogeneity among uh, patients. As you will see, there are different trajectories uh, of cognitive decline, and regular cognitive testing takes approximately uh, two hours to, to have a complete characterization of the cognitive decline. So our idea is if we can use EEG to uh, characterize this process of uh, cognitive decline. 
So we are developing within uh, one of our uh, European projects, a tool uh, for pre-processing uh, uh, data, extracting different features and offering these in form of a report to clinicians that want to use this tool for uh, facilitating decision-making. And we have integrated in this tool these different ratios that I was commenting so far, the slow to fast ratio, the theta to alpha ratio, and the peak alpha frequency. And we offer these, uh, uh, these different markers in a reporting after validating. And I'm uh, presenting here uh, the process of validation of these markers that we have conducted. And this is something we, got, we have conducted with two different data sets. The first one data set is uh, including only uh, subjects in healthy aging, which is a paper uh, describing uh, a database that it's called Lemon Dataset that was uh, published in 2019. Uh, it includes uh, not only people in healthy aging, but also in other ages. And in the case of aging, it includes more or less like 70 uh, different subjects and includes 16 blocks of one minute interleaf, eyes open and eyes closed resting state. The other data set that uh, we are using is this of uh, Mehdadi 2021, which includes uh, more or less uh, 150 subjects uh, with uh, normal healthy aging, but as well pathological aging, including minimal uh, cognitive impairment, as well as Alzheimer's disease. And this is what we have found. You see here the uh, particular marker, in this case, the peak alpha frequency in the parieto-occipital area. And you see here the value of the peak alpha frequency in the uh, Lehman data set. This is for uh, males and for uh, females. There are small differences, although they are not significant. Uh, what they are significant is to distinguish, and these are, excuse me, uh, this is the group of the Lehman data set, and this is the different analysis of the Mehdadi data set. So these are the healthy controls in the Mehdadi data set, and this is the MCI group and the AD uh, group. And here you have the different distributions uh, of the different groups. And basically what you can find is significant differences to distinguish the healthy control group with respect to the group of MCI and Alzheimer's disease uh, patients. In the case of the theta alpha ratio, we have validated this as well in the parietal area, and we have found very clear differences uh, between uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the markers in the healthy control of both data sets. This is the first data set, this is the second data set. This is the group of MCI in the Mehdadi data set, and they all together uh, present very clear differences with the uh, group of Alzheimer's disease uh, in the uh, Mehdadi uh, that data set. And with this, you can establish as well some thresholds of the equilibrium rate to distinguish between the different groups and establish so-called uh, decision matrix where you can use the validated uh, uh, markers that in our case, what we have validated so far is the theta alpha ratio, the slow to fast ratio, and the peak alpha frequency, you can establish these different thresholds for females and males. And this delivers you a Boolean or a, a, a value uh, that tells you uh, if you can differentiate based on this marker between different uh, groups. And we try to summarize all these findings in a reporting that we deliver basically it offers some analysis of the frequency response uh, of the different electrodes, as well as some measures of uh, the peak alpha frequency, what is the distribution of the scalp, some color codes to know uh, if they are over normalized values or are uh, on the normalized range, and this, and then this decision matrix that uh, aims to facilitate the work of uh, 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 clinicians in the decision-making uh, process.
And now, so far, uh, all the markers that have to do with slowing, these are not so much uh, very uh, innovative markers. I'm trying to uh, find out or to give an insight on other markers that are also appearing in the literature. Uh, for instance, so-called connectivity markers. Uh, this has been uh, first uh, uh, underscored as important uh, in this review that I was already commenting in Babylonian and colleagues 2021. So they specifically underscored the importance of connectivity markers for characterizing the process of cognitive decline and for including EEG markers in clinical trials. Um, this has been also underscored in another paper uh, by Maestu and colleagues uh, of 2021. This is a paper very interesting because it uh, tries to make a link between the EEG uh, slowing markers and uh, computational neuroscience markers that try to explain mechanistically why this, why this process of slowing uh, can be linked to process in at the neuronal level. And this affects not only the uh, power spectral response as we were seeing with this slowing, but also this connectivity between different parts of the brain. This is what you see here. This is uh, uh, the different electrodes in the EEG. This is a uh, process of reduction of synchronicity, and this is an increase of synchro synchronization between the different areas, which is, uh, has been here plot in red. And as you can see, uh, uh, in the different areas of cognitive decline from the preclinical phase, when the subjects are at healthy aging stage, in the prodromal phase of uh, Alzheimer's disease, which includes uh, subjective cognitive decline, as well as uh, MCI stages, and then in the dementia uh, stages. You can characterize this evolution uh, in the uh, stage with, uh, on the one hand, as an increase of uh, synchronization uh, uh, in, uh, in very particular uh, areas, mostly uh, frontal areas, but it's combined as well from the prodromal phase with a decrease also from synchronization that it's generalized in the dementia phase. And I recommend you to read this paper because I think it's a very, very interesting link, uh, link between the EEG biomarkers and the, uh, and the, um, uh, uh, and the different uh, mechanisms at uh, neuronal uh, uh, level. Uh, this is basically this evolution of synchronization measure, this decrease in the dementia phase of synchronization is what has been observed, for instance, in the paper by Mehdadi and colleagues that I was already commenting before. Uh, you see here again, this uh, connectivity biomarkers is basically you are trying to measure the relationship between one electrode and the other with measures like, for instance, the correlation or the coherence. And then you plot this uh, relationship with a link between these two uh, different electrodes. Large values are in red, so uh, small values or negative values of correlation are in, in blue. So you can see already here in the uh, Alzheimer's disease phase, there is a very clear decrease of uh, normalized coherence in the alpha band, uh, which is significant, which is uh, plotted here in these different plots, which is significant in most of the electrode combinations in the uh, Alzheimer disease phase. But these co connectivity markers are not only very clearly offering a solution for distinguishing MCI from AV, but also from, uh, for distinguishing healthy controls from um, the MCI. So you see again, so a decrease of uh, uh, this alpha coherence, which can be measured uh, uh, as uh, interhemispheric of different interhemispheric uh, connectivity uh, measures. This has been proposed in another uh, paper that analyzes concretely 
connectivity biomarkers, but Rossini had colleagues in 2020, and they go a step further uh, in the sense that they are not measuring connectivity at the electrode space, as in the case of the Mehdadi paper, but they are first trying to localize the source of electrical activity uh, within the brain, uh, within the brain with different approaches, like for instance, uh, Loretta. And once you have this activity at the source level, they, they find out these connectivity matrices. You would have here some electrodes, some other electrodes. And this is the relationship of, not electrodes, sorry, source, uh, different sources here with the different sources and the relationship between this uh, the activity at these different sources. And you can establish these uh, connectivity matrices, but and try and you can use these matrices as well to uh, analyze, and this is what they comment in this paper, uh, to uh, apply a more advanced graph analysis to distinguish these uh, cases where you have combinations of uh, hypo and hyper uh, synchronicity in uh, the prodromal phase of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And finally, uh, lastly, I would like to go over some interesting uh, uh, markers which are not extracted in resting state, as I was uh, commenting so far, but I are extracted, evoked as a response of an external stimulus. Uh, in the preclinical phase, in, uh, for instance, in mice, it has been shown that uh, there is a reduction. You show here, so again, the power intensity, this is the frequency. When you stimulate uh, the brain of mice with different frequencies, uh, this is the normal response here. You see a reduction in, this, in the response of the brain in pathological states. Uh, at a particular frequency, uh, for instance, at uh, 40 hertz. Uh, this has been linked here to cognitive function. So there is a reduction in the gamma oscillatory activity in response to an external stimuli, which is linked to a reduction in cognitive function. And this is uh, why some groups, like in this paper by Armatore and colleagues in 2019, are trying to uh, apply this principle uh, by stimulating uh, with audio and uh, light and trying to revert this uh, uh, reduction in response at 40 Hertz and response as well. So, uh, and trying to mitigate the effect uh, of, uh, of, uh, the, um, but of the pathophysiology. Uh, the same principle, but not for treatment, but for measurement can be applied with a particular modality, which is called uh, auditory state, state response. And we have been testing this uh, in a group of uh, Down syndrome that, as you may know, uh, it's linked to uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. In a group of uh, 48 subjects have uh, healthy controls and have diagnosed of uh, Down syndrome. So we are working with, uh, within a clinical trial of the uh, Aelis Pharma, which are working in a, a treatment for uh, cognitive uh, improvement in, in Down syndrome with a, with a particular uh, drug treatment. Uh, here, what we apply is an auditory stimulation, uh, which uh, it's applied for 500 milliseconds with a train of different clicks. Uh, with an interval of 750 milliseconds of uh, uh, silence between different uh, uh, pulse interval. And basically, uh, uh, the uh, brain is uh, answering to this external stimulate, stimulation with, uh, in normal condition, it's answering with a rhythm, with an increase of power at the same 40 hertz uh, uh, rhythm. And this is what we have observed uh, in healthy controls. This is what you see uh, here at particular electrodes uh, in the midline, uh, in the frontal, central, and the parietal part. This is the response of the healthy controls in the different frequency bands 
And uh, this is the response of the brain uh, in time when average over different uh, trials, uh, while the stimulation is uh, uh, starting at zero. So when you apply the same auditory stimulation in Down syndrome, what you see is a clear reduction of this response of uh, 40 hertz. And you can basically average in this low gamma band, uh, this measure of intertrial coherence and plot it in this other uh, plot. Basically, you see here uh, the intertrial coherence, which is basically the synchronization between different epochs of a stimulation between one trial and the, and the others. And by averaging this over time, you find this uh, uh, response of the brain in healthy controls, what you have in blue, and we, in Down syndrome uh, that you have in, in orange. So basically you, have, you see a clear increase of interclear co coherence in healthy control, which is not present in uh, patients which are, who has been diagnosed uh, with uh, Down syndrome. And by averaging, you find out a very clear and significant differences between uh, healthy controls and Down syndrome. And we think this is a very interesting uh, uh, biomarker, not in resting state, but uh, as an evoked response that can be used as well uh, to characterize uh, the prodromal phase of uh, cognitive decline. And of course, this is not uh, an individual effort. This is a, a group effort of the different people of the neuroscience business unit uh, at Starlab. Uh, and I'm very uh, happy uh, to lead the group. I'm also very happy to be here today and to ask to answer uh, any questions that, that you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Aureli. Um... Thanks for the great presentation. Actually, we have many questions for you. Actually, we have uh, more than 250 uh, attendees actually right now with over 50, 50 questions already. So we'll go through some of them as we don't have time for all of them. And uh, I would start with a question from, from Vanya. Uh, as you know, there are many conditions and diseases that can show non-specific slowing on the EEG. So diagnosing Alzheimer's disease or MCI poorly on EG might be challenging. How do you how do you propose to overcome this? To have this, uh, yeah, having the 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 information only based on on EG, or do you propose to use this like the multimodal uh, approach and uh, solve the the problem of the biomarkers in this way? Yeah, so uh, that's why I was uh, mentioning and I find also very interesting uh, the approach uh, that it's described in the Maestu and colleagues paper of 2021, where they combine not only uh, EEG, but also they offer uh, some mechanistic explanations of why this slowing of the EEG is happening in the concrete case of the Alzheimer disease. So I think this is a, a, an interesting way to go. So to combine EEG with uh, computational neuroscience models uh, of the processes underlying the slowing of the EEG. And as well, I think it's interesting as a tool of differential diagnosis when you have already a specific question to be, to be answered. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, connecting with this with question from Bruna. So you were talking a lot about the the linear futures of the of the EEG. When so, where do you find like non-linear futures like uh, fractal dimension or, or or complexity? Because you know we know that we have the slowing of alpha power, for example, increasing delta power. But on the other side, we have the uh, lowering of fractal dimension or lowering of the complexity of the signal. Uh, and how to connect this? Actually, this is a question from Bruna. How to connect this with the with the um, cognitive explanation of the disease? What's going on in the brain? Actually, that there are these changes in the G with, in the in the on the linear and non-linear way. Okay, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. So specifically, we are looking into uh, into complexity of EEG signals with a particular marker that we have developed. 
And the idea that we have, but we don't have uh, now published results, is to uh, try to correlate this complexity with uh, cognitive uh, with cognitive performance uh, in different tasks. Uh, this is something that we are working on. I hope that I will have more insight in uh, some uh, months, but uh, definitely I think the complexity uh, has been linked. We have been working in complexity with uh, um, disease of uh, consciousness, uh, where we can we have found uh, very clear uh, uh, differences between healthy control condition and uh, patients in vegetative state and minimal consciousness state. But we think also that this can be linked as well to uh, cognitive processes, and this is what we are trying to find out. And the other thing is going beyond this slowing of the EEG. I think these uh, connectivity markers offer a very good uh, complementary measure of the slowing of the EEG. And um, I would also add to this uh, some task related uh, EEG markers as the one that I was presenting in the, in the last part of my talk. So basically going from restive state uh, markers into event related or evoked uh, potentials, which might be a more um, more robust and also where you can link very directly to cognitive uh, responses if you in the case for instance if you have some cognitive tasks associated okay okay thank you very much actually there are many questions uh, uh, related to uh, how confident are you in the differentiating between the the healthy controls and MCI you mean uh, in terms of, of research purposes and in terms of uh, clinical applications for the neurologists and neurophysiologists? There is a question from Christina and combined with Vanya and another uh, with, uh, with specifically requesting uh, what, what, how, how, how you define the alpha peak, for example, frequency uh, decrease and increase uh, generally uh, in, in uh, MCI patients, in AD patients. So basically, I was showing, so we were analyzing the peak alpha frequency, uh, basically by looking at the uh, highest uh, at the highest peak in the parieto occipital area. Uh, and we found very clear significant differences between uh, the healthy control group and the group of MCI and Alzheimer disease. And this has been also uh, uh, already shown in the Mehdadi paper very clearly. Uh, to distinguish uh, in this in this case, so uh, we can offer uh, this as a as a clear differences, and we found uh, very clear statistical differences uh, that we are about to publish uh, in the next uh, in the next uh, month. So, 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 in terms of the threshold, when you can distinguish between the healthy aging and like MCI uh, is the statistical difference that what you are explaining. This will be that clinicians would use in the in the clinical practice based on EG. Yeah, so we are trying to find out from the two distributions uh, of the peak alpha frequency uh, for the healthy controls in the different data sets we have analyzed and the distribution uh, of the groups of MCI and AD we are finding out some thresholds that we can apply just to offer uh, for the moment a uh, 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 distinguished so a, a, a Boolean value that tells you if this subject is more associated with the MCI plus AD group or more associated with the healthy control. Um, basically, this threshold is not, uh, you are doing some error and we can provide and provide in the reporting as well this error that it's associated with the threshold that you use in the in the in the uh, discrimination between the two groups. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So another like uh, technical more question: How do you screen and handle artifacts in the EEG tracings? Do you have automated methods for eliminating artifacts, and how reliable are they for the for the uh, 
analysis of EEG to use to have clean EEG. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we are we are uh, extracting EEG and cleaning so artifacts. There are very different pipelines that have been published in the literature. So uh, not only for uh, EEG in lab conditions, but there are also uh, toolkits that allow uh, as well to clean uh, the EEG in out of the lab conditions, which is a, a very interesting uh, uh, also uh, way of applying. The most okay. easy way of cleaning artifacts is applying some thresholds. Uh, not only in the broadband, but also on some specific bands where you uh, expect uh, the artifacts, the muscle artifacts to appear. And another way of cleaning artifacts and that we uh, uh, conduct in our uh, studies is to apply ICA and then try to find out and eliminate components that are associated with artifacts. And then as I was commenting, uh, there are different uh, uh, methods like the ASR, which are uh, specifically being developed for cleaning artifacts in all alternative ways as the uh, ICA, uh, as, as the ICA uh, cleaning. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, question from Michelle. Uh, how reproducible are these EEG measures within subjects? Exa uh, for example, day to day, week to week, uh, are there diurnal variations in power? spectra and actually how you how you how you um extend this to to pathology actually you were at the beginning you were explaining that there are some specific disorders that you can detect during REM sleep for example and uh, so we have like a uh, possibility to record during wakefulness during sleep uh, and uh, that can be changes within the the related to sulcoidal rhythm changes uh, and not because of pathology how how how, how you see this uh, within measures within the, the, the same subject and the reproducibility of the, of the results. Yeah, that's a very important question, a very interesting question as well. Uh, in the case, for instance, of the Parkinson study, it has been taken into account in the sense that we are analyzing EEG while awakened for a, from a polysomnography session for uh, diagnosing uh, the RBD. So all the patients and all the healthy subjects are acquired at the same uh, conditions, uh, more or less of the time of the day and of uh, circadian rhythm, rhythms that uh, are known also to have a, uh, an influence of the, uh, in the EEG measures. Uh, I was thinking though uh, the other day that in the same way that you conduct uh, blood analysis in very specific conditions, uh, the same could be done or could be uh, proposed to be done with EEG. So like uh, to offer uh, very uh, specific uh, constraints to the uh, people participating in the EEG studies. And this is one of the um, guidelines that are uh, mentioned in this uh, paper by Babylonian colleagues. So basically that you have very standardized and harmonized uh, measures of EEG in order to avoid this uh, intersubject variability. Another way of overcoming the intersubject variability is not to take into account uh, resting state measures, but take into account, as I was commenting in the last part of the presentation, uh, evoke uh, responses, which I think offer a large degree of robustness with respect to the uh, uh, intersubject variability and intrasubject variability as well. Okay, okay, and I assume that within the same condition, like eyes closed, eyes open, specific tax, mental counting, or whatever. But Arivan is asking actually, how how what 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 are the conditions when you are cal uh, calculating the PSD, for example, of EG? Uh, th those are within the specific conditions of the subjects. Yeah. Uh, in the works that I was showing, so we have been working uh, specifically on the eyes closed condition. So we have those so interleaf uh, uh, intervals of eyes open and eyes closed in the data acquisition. This is important in order to keep uh, a certain degree of alertness in the subject while acquiring the EEG in resting state. But as I was commenting, it is very difficult to avoid 
a certain uh, variability, uh, both intersubject and intrasubject variability when you are acquiring uh, uh, resting state uh, EEG. That's why we think it's interesting to come not only with uh, resting state measures, but also with task related ones. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, there are questions uh, like very practical. Where, where do you think this will be applied in the clinical settings directly? So there are questions from neurologists, uh, when they will be able to use this in the, in the clinical practice, when, if, you can, if you can somehow predict uh, if we have available. So we would be very happy to certify uh, this as a diagnosis tool so soon, and therefore to have it in the clinic. Uh, there is a still a way to go, uh, basically uh, to characterize better uh, the errors that you are having in this decision uh, making process also to characterize uh, very well what are the confidence uh, intervals of these decisions and the process basically is to conduct a comparative studies of uh, EEG and other tools that are being used currently in the diagnosis of uh, in the diagnosis in this prodromal phase of uh, alzheimer disease and then to transfer this to the cl clinic clinician. From the point of view of the hardware, I think that we are uh, also very clearly going into the direction that this co could go to the clinic, especially with the development of electrodes that allow for an easier acquisition of EEG signals, because one of the problems in the clinics of uh, this kind of acquisitions is that uh, elderly people uh, have some problems if acquiring EEG and they have to put some gel on the hair and they have to clean the hair and so on. So I think if we manage to develop as we are doing some electrodes to acquire these in either in semi-dry conditions or in dry conditions, uh, some solutions that uh, we are offering, this could be a really a breakthrough in the, in the, in the diagnosis of uh, cognitive decline. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, one of the last questions we have from, from Jennifer, beautiful work. Uh, beyond the identification and monitoring of biomarkers, do you have plans to use this knowledge to provide personalized therapeutic stimulation with TDCS? So we are moving to the part of the, of the, the, the therapeutic use, not only the detection, diagnosing, yeah. monitoring, but also to, to the therapeutic part of the story. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And thank you very much. Uh, so specifically within uh, one of our research projects, we have developed a system uh, where we extract uh, these power band uh, markers and then uh, on different uh, 20 electrodes. And then based on these markers, we applied some uh, clustering methodologies and find some electrophysiological profiles. We have conducted this in a group of healthy control subjects that go afterwards through a session of uh, transcranial uh, current stimulation. And we, interestingly, what we have uh, seen is that the uh, groups, the subgroups of uh, subjects that show an, at an atypical response, also a slowing of the EEG, although they are uh, although they are healthy controls, but they show a clear slowing of the EEG, these particular subgroups uh, show a response in the TDCS intervention that other subgroups do not show. And you can find a paper, if you send me an email, I can uh, send you a bioarchive uh, paper that we have already published and that we are about to submit uh, to a peer-reviewed uh, journal. And so I think definitely, this is a very interesting uh, domain of research, basically by, because there is a very clear link uh, between the EEG measures and the application of uh, transcranial current stimulation, uh, not only from the point of view of the, uh, so of the biophysical characteristics of the brain, but also from the point of view of the uh, hardware that you can use for acquire EEG 
and this year. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Aureli. We're running out of time, so we have still many questions to answer. Can, can our attendees contact you somehow um, and uh, you'll be providing an answer? Yeah, I will share uh, my email here. Uh, that's my email. You can okay. Very, I'm very happy to receive any feedback from the from the workshop and any interest that you may have on the markers and any other question that you may have on, on the content of the of the presentation. Okay, we will we will um, collect our questions that we we couldn't answer during this session and we'll provide to you. But if anyone has uh, some additional question, please contact Aureli directly and we'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Aureli, for the presentation. Uh, thanks for your time and thanks uh, everyone for questions. Uh, I also want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, and I hope you will join us again for the next webinars. Actually, on December 15, we'll have with us Professor Kim Shapiro from the University of uh, Birmingham, who will be talking about uh, combined working memory training and transcranial electrical stimulation. So something that uh, it's directly connected to to the topic we are talking about today. So please join us for the for the next webinar. Uh, uh, you will find the, the information on our webpage. This webinar has been recorded and will be will be provided by email to all participants. Uh, we will include uh, in this email also links to all additional information you may need, like ebooks, projects, and publications. So um, once again, thank you very much. Have a great day, and we'll see you next uh, time. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.